hello to everyone and thank you for joining us today uh, for this uh, Capital Insider series where we are joined today uh, by Surya Mantha, who is leading United Ventures uh, here in India. It's a leading venture fund, uh, largely investing in early stage uh, startups in technology uh, with a big focus on health tech, on ed tech, as well as fintech, and also, as I could tell, logistics uh, is a large part of their portfolio here in India. And what is also good about uh, United Ventures is because they have a presence in USA, they are able to, in fact, uh, in, ensure that there is a good cross-border movement of startups and they're able to find the resources, talent, or any other help that they require from the US. So thank you very much for joining us, Surya. We're delighted to have you here for the Capital Insiders uh, series today. And, um, you know, uh, things uh, have changed so dramatically. I mean, these last six months have probably changed the entire landscape of how we looked at business. So particularly for uh, you at United Ventures, I mean, the pre-pandemic, and the mid-pandemic as uh, we are sitting in currently, how are you looking at things differently? What kind of business trends is it that you are today um, seeing there um, uh, in, in your own portfolio? And also looking at particularly from a new startups perspective, new investments perspective, how is it that you're now evaluating startups differently? I mean, how have your lenses changed? Uh, sure, basically? yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, there's so many questions rolled into that one question, so I hopefully uh, I'll be able to answer each one of them in sequence. If I don't, please remind me. Uh, so yeah, so uh, um, you know, uh, one other point that I would like to add to uh, the introduction to you, you gave to United Ventures is uh, uh, two points actually. Uh, one is that in addition to being an uh, early stage. Uh, 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 tech uh, venture fund, uh, which is looking for great entrepreneurs and, and uh, opportunities in the health tech, fintech, job tech, ed tech space, spaces. Uh, we, another thing that is in, uh, uh, in incredibly important to us, which is core to our thesis, is that we look for uh, uh, companies that are going to make uh, uh, a difference, a positive difference into the lives of uh, disadvantaged peoples, low income populations, at scale, uh, so we are we are in that sense uh, we are uh, uh, we have a laser-like focus on on uh, commercial uh, returns, benchmark returns for our investors. Uh, but at the same time, it is critically important that these companies make uh, uh, a significant impact, uh, whether it is in terms of uh, access to financial services or better healthcare or better livelihoods and, and, and hence better out life outcomes. That is critically important to us. Uh, the second piece uh, that I wanted to say was, yes, uh, United uh, benefits tremendously from uh, having presence in the US. Uh, two of our partners and, and a part of our team is there. But an equally important part is that we are, we are member, we are in fact the founding member of the Capria network uh, Capria Ventures is a, is a fund of funds which was founded by a couple of our partners, uh, of our own partners, who uh, invest in, in uh, the, you know, uh, for-profit commercial but impact-oriented fund managers across emerging markets uh, from Southeast Asia to Africa to South Asia to Turkey to many in Latin America. So there is a network of over 20, 30 fund managers like Unitas uh, uh, who have the, uh, uh, the, the, the tremendous opportunity for cross-pollination, for learning, for, for uh, understanding deals, for sourcing deals, for taking companies, uh, 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 you know, introducing new markets to our own entrepreneurs or bringing uh, 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 companies from those markets into India. So, that's a tremendous network that Unitas is also part of now. Now coming to the, to the pandemic. Uh, so one thing is clear. Um, I mean, people, you can call it a black swan event, though it is not uh, uh, a black swan event by the strict definition of the term. Uh, everybody knew uh, that it was gonna happen. This was gonna happen sometime. Bill Gates had, had uh, given consistent and clear warnings for a lot of period of time. And over the last 10, 12 years, we've had several uh, such things, or, or, you know, which were uh, um, fortunately contained much faster, like Ebola or SARS and so on. So, but 
it is certainly true that uh, an event, a pandemic of this nature, has not happened in the lives or careers of any of our entrepreneurs or any of our own lives as fund managers and professionals. And I can probably wager a bet that it not happened in the, in the lifetimes or, uh, of, of any of the other portfolio managers or entrepreneurs in India, whether it is early stage or mid stage or what have you. So this is trial by fire. This is the kind of thing that separates the men from the boys and the women from the girls, right? Uh, though it is good to be young, actually, but in any case. Uh, um, so, um, but, uh, so essentially, you know, that's when you look into the mirror and look at yourself and say, okay, what do I need to do to survive this? The f that is the first question you ask, right? And in our case in particular, and, and I think this applies to many uh, 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 of the early stage funds, our companies, while uh, you know, our thesis that is that at some point in time, you know, over the next five, six, seven years, they'll grow to be big, valuable, resilient, robust companies. They're all fairly early in their life cycle, and have are constrained by the resources that they have. So the first thing that comes to mind is how am I going to survive this? If I had no revenue, how long is my runway? If I had zero revenue, that's the first plan you do. And then you look at various scenarios of if I, ha if I get to 20% of my revenue, if I get to 50% of my revenue, and so on, right? Then, okay, and, and that, that's a very sobering moment. Then you look at your costs. Okay, what can I live with and what? Then it becomes like a household budget I I immediately, right? Then you're saying, okay, what, what, you know, everything is up. Everything is up for discussion. There is nothing, there are no sacred cows, right? Whether it is, yeah, and when it comes to, and this, uh, uh, and, and I'm proud to say that almost every single one of our uh, entrepreneurs, and, and I hope that that's the case with, if you talk to any of the other venture funds, stepped up to the plate and took the hard decisions and showed the leadership that is required, right? Uh, for instance, you know, if it is uh, uh, trying to trim the, the payroll cost. Okay, so now this is an opportunity to get any way you are planning to get, uh, let go of the bottom 10 percentile in terms of performance, this is a good time to do it. If you are instituting pay cuts, then you lead by leadership, you know, through example. It is the leadership team that takes the deepest cuts and then it's a graded cut. Also for your most, if you are giving them, if you're, if you're instituting a pay cut, then are you compensating that through ESOPs? This is a fantastic, terrific time to reward your employees through ESOPs because that goes towards building long-term value and it kind of shows who is in it for the long haul and who is not, right? Then, for instance, all, all vendor payments, all arrangements, with whether it is with your customers or vendors, they are all up for discussion. Many of our B2B companies, they, they, they complete, they change to, in many cases, a prepay mode. In many cases, raising invoices twice a, uh, a month. Uh, uh, reducing uh, payment terms from 60 days to 30 days, right? Just, just having a laser-like focus on your cash and on your, or your, on your working capital. So every business becomes a cash flow business and not a balance sheet business. I mean, not a P&L business, right, for a while. So these are, these are the things that you do immediately, right? And, and say, okay, am I, do I now have the length of runway where I can step back and I look at my business as to how it has, what can I now really do from a product strategy, from an offering strategy, go to market and so on perspective, right? Now, clearly, if you are, if you are in retail or, or things that requires large physical gatherings of people, right? then that the problem becomes that much harder, right? Even there, there are examples actually of companies who have completely pivoted their business model and made things go totally digital. There are a few, a couple of examples I can give off in the US and so on. But in the Indian context, uh, or, or in our context, uh, those are the most challenged companies, right? Retail, brick and mortar retail, entertainment, uh, gym, gyms and so on and so forth. Uh, 
So, uh, and those companies whose business model has used technology uh, as a way to reach customers, uh, they have a, a, a more inherently uh, resilient and robust model uh, when, when, when these kinds of uh, disruptions happen, right? Uh, so that, that is, that's something that applies across sectors, across sectors. Uh, uh, whether it is ed tech, it's entertainment, it is e-commerce, it is, it is online sales, what have you, even in jobs, uh, 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 earlier, you know, there is, a, there is a portfolio company of ours which is in the business, it's a, it's a fintech company, it's an MBFC, which gives loans to students and uh, uh, young professionals for job-directed training courses, classes, right? Now, uh, uh, and, and they're of course agnostic about jobs, uh, uh, whether it's a physical job or an or a online job. Now they pivoted and there was a lot of opportunity for what I call online for online, online training, online courses for online work, right? So every company, uh, there is another company of ours, which is uh, uh, um, uh, called Avigna, which is sort of the, the which has, it's, it's a gig, plat gig economy company where we, they have a platform, a technology platform that takes the last mile work that large distributed companies have, whether it is FMCG or new age companies for due diligence or mystery audits or revenue leakage or business development and so on, or, or retailer onboarding and so on. And they take those projects and pass them out into smaller tasks and they have a distributed workforce at the other end uh, that uh, executes these tasks. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the clients, the corporates can rest assured that these projects are being done by one vendor at, co you know, a, a, within budget and on time and so on. So what they did was immediately, because they saw a dip in their business, obviously like anybody else, but they came up with a COVID compliance offering, which is, you know, after the first month or two were uh, over that, Hey, I can use the same platform, the same systems, process, technology, and people combination to actually help large distributed corporations implement COVID compliance among their employees, right? So uh, basically, these are two examples of innovation in your business model or in your product offering where you say, okay, the world's changed. What can I do differently to, to uh, respond to that in addition to whatever cost measures and so on and so, so forth you're taking? So basically, Every company, some things are common to all companies. They all have to do that, the cost measures. Others depend on their context, on their business and, and, and their inherent you know, set of capabilities. And they have to, they, they look at the market and say, how do I pivot? What new offerings can I uh, bring to the market that, that work in, this, in, the, in the circumstances that I find myself in? And, and the latter part is an ongoing journey. Okay, so that's where that's I mean, the last five months have been, I must say, probably the team at Unitas hasn't worked harder in their lives. You know, we've been uh, shoulder to shoulder with our entrepreneurs, helping them through this uh, difficult journey. But, uh, you know, all of them, most many, most of them, barring of one or two, obviously, who are struggling, have, are, 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 have come out of it. Uh, stronger because they realized that there was probably some bloat, their costs could have been lower, right? But you don't realize in normal conditions. It's only these kinds of things that, that, that uh, uh, help you uh, really focus on things that matter. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's still early. I mean, don't know how long this whole thing will last. Uh, and uh, maybe there's a new normal at least for the next year and a half to two years. And uh, I think entrepreneurs are, are adjusting to that, adapting everything, all their operations, mindsets and all to, to work in the new world. Sure, no, I think that's, that's very valuable, Surya, what you've shared. Um, you know, my, uh, uh, something that, uh, and I mean, you've given us a cross spectrum look at 
uh, how you how are you dealing with your existing startups as well as you know how startups should largely think but from a pandemic's perspective and also from a perspective of the fact that you know we are in completely new environments today uh, we're working from home we've not been used to it we've not been brought up with working from home as a culture so you know um, i mean what is it and i i read uh, you know, you had once said that it's the uh, it's the founding team that counts the most. Uh, you know, so whenever you're looking at investing in any particular startup, you look at more. I mean, while of course the idea is very important and what is it that they're trying to achieve to sort of bring a change is very important. But also you look very closely at the founding team, and you yes. know what what perspective that the founders bring. So particularly evaluating what the founders bring to the table. How how is it? I mean, what qualities of founders is it that you have? Uh, found coming out during this pandemic and I mean how are you trying to work with particularly your own portfolio founders um, to make sure that they they be not just resilient I think but they're able to sort of hold on I mean you know things are falling apart for everybody I mean for your founders pretty much for every startup founder today and just to sort of first have the uh, uh, you know the patience to say that look I'm gonna uh, put everything together is really hard and particularly our founders are so young. So how, how is it that, you know, uh, what qualities are there that you look at in the founders during that early days of actually investing in them, which now you feel are sort of, uh, because you did it at that time, is now uh, coming to fruition. It's now sort of showing its best um, phase. Right, you know, a terrific point. See, I mean, we all talk about these qualities and it is only, uh, uh, not very often, mercifully, that those qualities get tested, right? And this is, this is uh, God couldn't have sent a harder test. I think uh, almost every quality of every entrepreneur of every portfolio has got tested simultaneously, right? So it's, it's, the, it's the same thing. There are a few things about the, the founders, and there are a few things inherent in the, about the business model that they have. If they're really dependent on, on uh, 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 they, 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 their company strategy is irrevocably attached to physicality, right. to people coming in, then even your strongest founder will, will not be able to do much. He may do something else. He may say, I will do something else, right? But, so barring that, barring that, uh, it is the same qualities. It is, it is clearly... Uh, uh, you know, intelligence and capabilities are table stakes, right? If you are slow, if you're dull, you will not be able to respond to it. Second, two, two, two most important things is one is willingness to listen and agility and the ability to respond fast. And third is a, is an, is a very interesting mix of urgency with calm. So there has to be a sense of urgency, right? But at the same time, you know, not, not radiating anxiety, but doing it from a sense of calm. However anxious you may feel at night as an entrepreneur, you may not go to bed, but with your team, with your investor and with your, and particularly with, with the junior and mid-level teams, projecting a sense of confidence and calm that we'll get through this, right? And then with entrepreneurs, with investors and advisors, the, the willingness to learn, to listen, and incorporate ideas, you know, counsel, advice, and so on, and check the ego at the door. Sure. That, those, those are huge qualities, right? Because uh, obviously, when somebody has, has uh, undertaken an entrepreneurial journey, they have crossed a certain threshold of, of risk taking ability, uh, passion, and, and uh, being self-motivated, and so on and so forth. But there are, these, there, are, and there are these other qualities, right? A certain level of humility, ability to listen, you know, uh, uh, and all of those. That they, those get tested yes. a lot. Plus, plus urgency, agility, right? I mean, you are, you, you, the ability to deal with, uh, uh, take decisions without having all the information. Sure. And you pretty much here you have very little. You don't know how tomorrow will be, right? With lockdowns, you know, uh, it is like whack-a-mole. I mean, we had a we have a driver 
uh, service company where if Bangalore is open today, Mumbai is locked down tomorrow. If Delhi opens, Hyderabad uh, gets locked down, right? So, so you have to have the ability to, to deal with that. I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, we, I mean, the severity of the storm is such that you don't know how to, so it, it has to be managed in patches, really, as you said. Yeah. You know? So yeah. if you have a widespread uh, sort of customers, even if it's a digital business, it becomes as much difficult because you're not able to service some customers. In exactly. Some and, and your whole exactly. business model goes for a toss in that. Exactly. Sense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, another another uh, important uh, area that I would love to know from you is that particularly I read that these are the three sectors that you sort of have always looked at at United Ventures is fintech, edtech and health tech. And I do feel that there has been some good movement which has happened in these sectors, particularly if you look at edtech. That's been the longest challenge for educational technology companies was the adoption of technology at the teacher's level to be able to broadcast it to the ch children. And now suddenly the pandemic just made it happen. You know, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, I mean, you know, particularly from these sectors perspective, all the three health tech, I mean, health has certainly become, you know, the number one priority today. So how is it that you're now evaluating startups for investments? I mean, you know, uh, considering that it's a good place to be in these uh, these three sectors. So within this, what? I mean, what, what particularly you see is going to be more um, suitable for making an investment in? So, so let's say, uh, very interesting. So let's take EdTech as an example. See, we were one of the early investors in EdTech and we have a real star in our portfolio called QMath. Mm. And uh, QMath is uh, actually very interestingly had a very physical business model. They okay. would supply technology, content, process, expertise, and all of that to stay-at-home moms who would then get, you know, the neighborhood kids and teach them uh, uh, math uh, at the K-6 level. And clearly, the pandemic changed all of that overnight, right? And they were able to move all their teachers online within a month. So without missing a heartbeat, they went back to their uh, original level of business. But more interestingly, uh, they took their best teachers and went international. And they, they, they are growing, they've grown exponentially internationally. And with much, you know, uh, uh, because it's all online and, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, a good teacher, if she's uh, teaching math in an innovative way to a kid in her neighborhood, she can do that to a kid in Cincinnati or Seattle or, or uh, Birmingham or wherever, right? So they, the last eight months, their growth literally has been scorching. Sure. So, I mean, so, really so, so, <laughs> right, right. So we were fortunate, you know, we were one of the pioneers in uh, ed tech early on. And now we, we, our thinking has moved a little uh, from ed tech to what we call more job tech, hmm. where the education, educational content or training content or what uh, 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 or assessment content leads to a, uh, a very tangible outcome yes. immediately, right? Gets a job or gets a better income or, or, or so on and so forth. So in fact, uh, so that's something uh, we feel uh, is a sector where uh, particularly in India, where we have 1 million kids coming into the job market every month and that's going to continue for the next 20 years right just 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 wrap your head around that problem i think uh, uh, one of the probably biggest challenges in india is creation of jobs and not just creation of jobs second is matching supply with demand mm. and uh, uh, decreasing the employability gap because of uh, our uh, fairly variable quality of our education system, uh, way too many kids come out of college with degrees, even engineering degrees, without the skills required to, to uh, do their jobs. In fact, just yesterday we announced a, a, an investment in a company called Maasai School, you know, like the Maasai Tribe of Africa, where they have a seven month long boot camp like approach to programming. Uh, and software engineering. And they take kids from, you know, second to tier two, tier three colleges, engineering colleges, some dropouts, 
and, and almost many of them have no background in computer science. They just give them a test in math and logical reasoning. And through a mastery based progression strategy, after seven uh, uh, months of this course curriculum, most of them get employed not in you know IT services, but actually in serious product development jobs in, stra in startups and serious companies, right? They, they were largely online, delivery was online. They had uh, offline centers in Patna and in Bangalore for, because there's always a value to, to uh, uh, kids meeting, bonding, informal sessions, you know, there, there's all of that value. They had to go fully online. So one of the things that they have to figure out and which they are figuring out as they go is, is making sure that the uh, uh, student engagement, student satisfaction, learning outcomes or, or learning, the, the rate of learning, they do not get uh, impacted by going purely online. So you have to, obviously anything that can be delivered online is gonna benefit. It, I mean, it's not a profound statement. It's not a key insight. It is, a, we are seeing that I'm sitting here, you know, we are, we are, we are doing this interview on video. All of us have been on five Zoom, Zoom calls, five to six hours a day for the last five months, right? Doctor, uh, we've done doctor consultations on, on video. Who would have thought in India that we would do doctor consult? We've been trying to do that for years and this pandemic has compressed behavioral changes into a matter of months, right? You know, now, with Since you mentioned this, I mean, what, what I mean, particularly I was going to ask you about telemedicine becoming a very important area and then e-pharmacies, you know, we see so much sort of a back and forth moment and corporate interest and, you know, consolidation and acquisitions happening over there. So particularly from a healthcare perspective, I would say e-commerce has sort of made a huge comeback. I, I would never have imagined health uh, and e-commerce being so, uh, you know, hand in glove with each other. So yeah. particularly what, what movement do you see within health tech? Um, health, health tech is very interesting. Uh, it is see, the, obviously, I mean, e-pharmacy was something that had attracted a lot of investor interest and uh, also three, four scaled up players have emerged uh, uh, over the last five years, right? So e-pharmacy is certainly uh, something that, that is scaling up very fast. Uh, but what is interesting to me is that uh, for some reason, um, India being as big a market as it is, and, uh, and, and honestly, our healthcare, if you go beyond the top metros, is so patchy and so poor uh, that we have not seen many, many more large companies scaling up uh, in the healthcare space, whether it is electronic health records or telemedicine or, or what have you. Uh, apps for mental health, apps for women's health, apps for diabetes control, you know, and not just, just apps that people can use, but with proper business, sound business models for which people will pay, right? So it, it remains, uh, it is, I, I think the opportunity is there uh, it is a bit of mystery to to us uh, as well. I mean, the only things that have have uh, 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 scaled in India from an investor perspective are brick and mortar hospitals. Okay, and that's a very different cup of you know they don't uh, they they are in the in the delivery you know brick and mortar delivery space right whether it is uh, uh, multi specialty tertiary hospitals or or single specialty chains and so on. Uh, and e-pharmacy, but uh, the rest of healthcare, rest of healthcare has has not seen huge huge companies being built. Everybody believes, everybody believes that this is one of those disruptive move moments. That uh, uh, the pandemic will change behaviors, will throw up opportunities uh, in the health tech space as well. Uh, if I had uh, the answer to exactly where it will show up, I wouldn't be sitting here. But we are thinking, we are all thinking very hard. We are all putting on our thinking caps and I'm not the only one. I'm sure every guy in every uh, early stage fund is saying, okay, where is, 
where is that opportunity which is going to be the the next you know big thing in health tech because we've seen for instance fracto fracto there was a lot of initial uh, a lot of money has gone into fracto and they did a recent round at a big with a big with a big haircut so the prop the issue in india is you need to have your revenue model very clear because indians are very very value conscious it is very difficult to part an indian from his money very very difficult you right so <laughs> it is very easy for him to get used to a free service him or her so i really admire companies that are able on day one to get an indian consumer to say this is interesting i'll actually pay money for it and i salute such an entrepreneur so i it's going to happen in health that it will i don't have a very specific thesis as to where it will emerge which two three areas it will emerge but emerge they will in telemedicine i can tell you that sure and also just to touch upon what you mentioned about the other area sorry the other area that is that is largely untouched by technology and innovation is hospital management hmm. hospital management hospital procurement a lot of those things and there is a lot of corruption and so on and so forth you know uh, incentives perverse incentives over there so there is that whole area of bringing efficiency to hospitals of various sizes uh is we'll see a lot of innovation and the third area that will see a lot of innovation is insurance tech india is very under penetrated when it comes to insurance yeah. cost of insurance is high fraud is high there is not a lot of technology there so in fact we have a company in that space so another third area where i believe there will be a lot of innovation is in uh, using data machine learning ai all of these things will use that is in insur- insurance tech so telemedicine hospital efficiency and productivity management insurance tech all of these are 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 ripe for for innovation and disruption totally you know you also mentioned about edtech and i mean you know uh, the fact that you know you've invested in masai school which is also into coding and helping as you said uh, uh, children in uh, in hinterlands to actually you know get into um, a more employable skill uh, i mean do you think at some point of time you mentioned about hospitals having problems but i also feel the same problems exist with indian universities you know wherein we get a degree but it's not essentially an employable degree at all so i mean do you think that at some point of time we've already seen national education policy which is quite disruptive it's you know we all need uh, the school is only going to be till class 11 now and then you and that too you're going to have a lot of skills which are going to be now dealt with at the school level only so do you think the college particularly the degrees that we have in india they might get disrupted and people might not want to go to uh uh you know four year course unless they have something very specific in mind and they might want to actually take this one year course and get into a workforce it might happen you are absolutely right barring barring uh, the top few universities uh in the private public sector and the uh, private sector the new exciting new entrants like ashoka kriya flame and so on sisti and so on and then the old uh, uh faithful like the iits and the and the, and the bitspilanis of the world and presidencies and chiefs of the world you know education in this country is 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 mad so mad i mean there is really kids just spend 3 years i mean they make great friends they have fun uh uh and they waste their time right which yeah. is fine which is fine as a life experience but they're not getting the skills True. they're not getting the skills right and this are i'm talking about even the better colleges but if you go go into the the beyond the top 20 cities the education system is is abysmal right so the importance of skills over degree that that phenomenon is going to only strengthen there is no question about that in fact as i told you many at least a few of my high school grads are dropouts hmm hmm Yeah I mean right? and no and in fact one of the founders is himself one of the founders is himself a dropout hmm. from IIT so so you know the the uh, importance of skills and ability to perform and deliver over uh, degrees and pedigrees you are seeing that in the in the in the US as well 
and 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 uh, there will be another phenomenon that is on the rise is evaluation of of candidates not through their resume but through their ability to to actually perform particularly in programming engineering software engineering jobs and so on you 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 can do that you don't have to to do that through through just the resume because many of them they they need, just like an artist has a uh, has a as a portfolio these young guys in software engineering and software they have programs that they post to github okay and they they get fan following based on the quality and 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 uh, efficiency and the difficulty levels of their uh, of the work that they have done so you're absolutely right that we are we are we are going to see a lot of that and we will also see a lot of uh uh online uh certifications uh, that will come up uh, which may not be your traditional degree degree granting institutions whether that is in programming whether it's in design whether it's in marketing whether it is in uh, soft skills uh, you know my good friend pramod sinha has just launched a harappa.in which is uh, basically leadership skills uh, he's he's distilled his 30 years of corporate experience as well as experience starting uh, the isb and uh, ashoka university into into an online offering right so you will see you will see a lot of that uh, absolutely uh, no question about that sure totally agree so we've also got some questions pouring in surya which i think we should take up uh, sure. um, so you know the if we can please give uh, the audio to dorin nevang um is to render go ahead yes uh, yeah. yes sir i'm just looking for fundraising and uh, the in my pandemic through and all during my during my this time i have a lot of problem for manufacturing also unable to and even during this time how can i just come up beyond this pandemic to uh, overcome this situation that is the main i just want to know the uh, uh, like uh, my question is this how to overcome my pandemic this pandemic issue see i i, I, I mean that, that's a question on the minds of almost every entrepreneur uh, mm -hmm. the point is i don't uh, i will not be able to unfortunately give you a very specific answer because i do not have know the nature of your business and if it is a uh, look if it's a manufacturing business in the small mm -hmm. medium sector then the government has several programs for okay. uh, uh, loans uh, mm -hmm. that to to tide you over uh, you know this difficult uh, period uh, but, see uh, investors particularly equity investors will look for companies that can grow uh, big and deliver the kinds of returns that they have promised their own investors right so not every company is is uh, investable is equity private equity or venture investable and which is fine not every company needs to be in fact many india in many uh, companies in india it's a debt they are they, are, they 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 need debt right um, so i don't know the nature of your specific uh, problem in terms of what you do and 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 your own issues where the issues are whether it is working capital or 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 your uh, uh, um, you know you're just basically demand has collapsed or, or what's going on so yeah. but but uh, you need to the probably government programs you can access debt and and uh, uh, look at uh, various uh, 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 explore that uh, because this now is uh, unless you have a really strong post pandemic story uh, yeah. investors equity investors will be very shy of writing checks Oh. Uh, we've got another question uh, which says um, tourism and hospitality industries need to give a complete makeover. 3D and virtual reality is something we're looking at. Last Geo Meet, they have proposed some good plan, but how can small scale business do that makeover? Good, good question. Good question. i i i can uh, imagine 
the uses of 3D virtual reality, augmented reality for say training, for telemedicine, uh, for you know uh, all manner of educational training and so on purposes to give give a feeling of of of, of being in the situation. But uh, and for gaming, certainly gaming very important, very critical. Uh, but I don't know that they can uh, you can quickly so quickly innovate and and replace uh, you know tourism uh, regular tourism with virtual reality. It it will be hard. I don't think that the experience will be close to it. I would love to be wrong. Maybe in certain in certain uh, very specialized situations like. Uh, uh, say going to a museum now you know the metropolitan in new york uh, or the our own national museum in delhi uh, uh, or the salar jung museum in hyderabad may be able to come up with an online experience which is very rich right uh, but those are very specialized niche applications uh, but but the experience of going to Banaras or, or Istanbul or wherever your heart uh, wishes to take you is not going to be re uh, replicated by augmented reality or going to Masai Mara. Uh, uh, I, 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 I mean, it sounds a bit naive. Just because there is augmented reality doesn't mean that the world will fit neatly into it, at least uh, over the next two, three years. I think a lot more technology innovation, user experience innovation needs to be done. But there are clearly niche applications which, which will benefit from it. Sure. We have another question from Madhukar. If we can give him the audio, please. Um, in the meantime, as he comes on, um, you know, there's another question which says that what are the biggest hurdles you think the, because of the pandemic, uh, uh, the hurdles have come in people management in the work from home systems? Do you think HR tech softwares will be able to cross these hurdles? Good question. See, one of the, the things that, a few things that we've, we've seen in our own work is, is uh, uh, we've all, at least uh, uh, early stage, or any investment firm or any company, we've been working harder than ever. And particularly early stage because our portfolio it consists of young companies with limited amounts of cash and, and uh, you know, they, they can just go belly up quite fast. They don't have the resilience of large corporations with huge, you know, cash balances and so on. Uh, so, but everybody has delivered, but what it does lead to is, is uh, fatigue. Okay. A few things happen. The, uh, uh, the boundary between work and non-work vanishes unless you have really, really disciplined. So two things we've done as a firm is that Tuesday before lunch and Fridays after lunch, there are no meetings, no calls, so that you can do your own work. So you have to create me time, okay? Second, every week there is a compulsory video social. So typically most calls, what we do are audio calls. So, so, so how do you keep a sense of coherence, a sense of, you know, it's been five months since I have seen my colleagues, honestly, in, in person. We went, we as a firm went into lockdown, into virtual mode, March 15th. Today is August 20th or 21st or whatever it is, right? Over five months. That, that, that particularly for, for many people can be fairly uh, dis disorienting. A sense of belonging can go away. I mean, in fact, one, one colleague, a young colleague of mine said, I've been in this room. This room is where I sleep, where I do everything and where I work. And it's just this room. So then work, non-work boundary is, is, is non-existent. Right. So these issues of, of fatigue, of exhaustion, of getting away from work, of being, staying mentally healthy, all of these things become very critical, right? We are a small firm, but how do large com companies uh, where there is distributed project management, how do, how do they, uh, 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 how will they deal with this over a period of time? I mean, so many IT companies are saying that till the end of this year, you pretty much work from home, right? And then there is the matter of productivity, right? While people are, are, are some people have said that I'm working harder, but I'm not as productive, right? So there is clearly role for technology 
that that uh, uh, makes uh, processes more streamlined and uh, uh, to to help with this. Uh, but but this is is certainly again a very rich area for innovation and disruption. Is how do you make uh, distributed teams working online together for extended periods of time, productive, engaged, mentally fit and healthy, and with a sense of uh, uh, identity. With and 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 uh, uh, loyalty, or commitment to the company. The fact that I work for X, I, I you know, as opposed to you know, I'm a freelancer, or, or which is also fine. There is a whole freelance uh, way of life. But if you're an employee of a of a company, how do you feel that I'm still an employee of that company? How do you keep that engagement? So I I, I do expect to see interesting innovation there. But this is not an easy problem to solve. These are all, all fairly challenging, uh, 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 nuanced problems. And they also have cultural contexts. What works in the US may, may or may not work in India, right? Unlike, unlike Swiggy, unlike say, uh, uh, restaurant delivery or taking a shared cab, which is a similar experience, and there's not a whole lot different here or there. Maybe payment modes are different. Or there they pay with credit cards, here we pay with whatever. Uh, you know, uh, pay TM and so on, but these things that uh, involve psychology and 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 uh, uh, and so on and so forth, they have to be very nuanced and specific to uh, specific contexts. Sure. Yeah, I totally agree. There. Um, you know, Madhukar, if you would like to ask your question now, unmute yourself, please, first. Can you unmute and ask your question, Madhukar? Okay, so there is another question which is from Nara Kalyani who's asking, um, how can he a social helping idea be a good idea for business? Uh, do you think there can be a conflict in that in that session? How can we it be good? How can it be possible without good marketing, but the validation of the idea is there? Uh, so I think I I'm not sure I understand the question. I social... think what he's asking is that uh, if it is a socially, um, I mean, if it's a social idea, how is it? How can it really sort of uh, translate into business? No, you have to. The, there, uh, 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 there is no sacrifice. I mean, it, fine. It may it may be posi uh, positively impacting. Uh, uh, you know, uh, either through access, as I said, improving uh, incomes or, or uh, improving access to healthcare, financial services, getting a job and so on. But if you are providing a service, if that service is valuable, then somebody should be willing to pay for it. And you should be able to deliver that service at a cost that is less than what the customer is willing to pay for it. That is where the proof of the pudding lies. That, i.e., in other terms, in jargon, it needs to have healthy unit economics. That is the fundamental premise behind for-profit impact investing, is that you should be able to provide a service for which somebody is willing to pay. So the beneficiary, see, look, in the world, there, are, there is a whole cross-section of needs. At the lowest rung of the pyramid, there is not enough money to make to create profitable profitable businesses. So there is a strong role for the government, for philanthropy, and so on, for grant-based, NGO-based offerings. Okay, where the beneficiaries are, are are essentially recipients of grants of help. You go to the next layer above, where you have the aspirational. Hundreds of millions of people, honestly, beyond the first 150 million in India, who all want to improve their lives. They all have some income, 20, 25, 30, 15,000 a month or 20,000 a month. They want to be customers. The moment somebody is a customer, he can demand better service. There is a dignity in being a customer as opposed to being a recipient of a grant. So you, your, your, if you're service or offering is targeting that segment, 
then you need to to have a value proposition where the customer is willing to pay that money to you on the other hand if your business your idea your social idea is looking at improving the lot of people who are at even a much lower level who can't afford to pay for it then the then the way you get that service to them is in a different model then you work through grants then you is it right that it, you are not building a for profit profitable business there that can scale by attracting investors so there are different models for different strata of 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 society in the in the socio economic pyramid am i making sense to you then you making sense to me for sure okay okay, <laughs> okay so there is uh, somebody who's asked us on facebook um uh, shalab dhingra who's saying what is the scope of domain specific edtech solutions say for example only for hospitality and or not something else i mean if it is a large domain i i prefer horizontals because you know uh, then they 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 are uh, inherently a little more robust if one sector goes down the other can right so if it is a design skills marketing skills software engineering and programming skills their data analysis and 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 inter, right those are applicable across uh, oh nara kalyani likes my explanation you are most welcome uh, um, so yeah but but if you are if you are if you taken a very large uh, uh, segments i mean verticals then obviously the uh, that's fine Uh, and clearly hospitality requires a lot of help at this point so uh, you know if you have uh, innovative interesting ideas that could help that sector then more power to you don't don't get into markets that are that are are very small because if they are if they are smaller small niche markets then you have to make sure that you have you 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 assume get a get to a leadership position so if for that your your uh offering has to be that much more compelling from a value or a cost perspective and uh also if you are going to get into markets that are winner take all and and uh, which will largely be be uh propelled by the momentum of capital then be very careful it is uh, right so uh, my my counsel to to kids to people who are building real businesses uh is to ensure that you have sound unit economics sure i think we'll take one question from uh, um, you know that has come in from again from facebook uh, which says that you know uh, the the covid has given a death knell to the gym culture but fitness is very important uh, so do you think more startups are going to come in or like fitness apps to keep track on users health i mean this, yeah. this is something i would love to know because you know i know initially we had these uh, iot products these watches which would help us track our uh, you know our body and you know how we were exercising and they were quite a rage and they still are to a large extent but i mean do you think we need more products like these in order to be able to now probably do it at home i mean do it in our own times so how do you think um, things might change in that direction you know this is a, this is a very uh, a, a relevant and, and question to in my own life I mean, both my wife and i go to a, used to go to a trainer a local specialized gym our daughter used to go to cult fit which is our cult fit or one of those i think it's that that uh, network um uh the, see what a trainer does is uh, by having a routine he or she motivates you okay and plus also that trainer has the uh, ability to fine tune and 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 create the program uh, suited to your needs and your progress and your problems on an ongoing basis the both of these aspects are very important you uh, if even if 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 let's say that the the personal uh, trainer bit may be uh, if it's expensive for people but the motivation bit is very important when you paid money to go to a gym at a certain appointed hour you will and there is a you go there right uh, you can do a lot i mean in theory you can actually buy weights you can buy all the, some of that equipment and do all of that shit at home right there is nothing stopping you from doing it is the fact is that unless you are so inherently motivated 
And the sad thing is most people are not. Uh, they require external prods, whether in terms of paying a trainer or the trainer sort of thing, or the gym saying that you better show up on this day or whatever, right? So uh, how do you simulate that uh, uh, through an app to, to get the same level of motivation so that you don't fall by the wayside after, after uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a few sessions or a month or a couple of months? That to me is, is a very important. The efficacy of the training is not so difficult. I think it can, that can be done. Uh, what will... Uh, 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 require a lot more thinking is how do you complete the feedback loop? How does the trainer, if there is a trainer at the other end of the app in real time, watching your progress, uh, how do they see whether, uh, uh, how you are doing in terms of your muscle strength, this, that, and the other, and accordingly, you know, fine tune the, the training schedule and regimen, right? Uh, if, if somebody can really solve for the motiv motivation problem, the rest of the things can, 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 I think, fall in place quite well. There is motivation and, and, and also the, the fact that you go to a gym, there are other people over there, you know, there is a sense of shared pain. <laughs> so, so, so there are all those aspects which, are, which seem trivial, they are not trivial. They are just not trivial. Sitting in your house, in your room, you'd probably much rather switch on Netflix and stuff your face with chips than uh, uh, switch on this app and, and, and start uh, roll on the yoga mat and start doing exercises. That's just human nature. And uh, other than the, this may work for the, the really disciplined 5%, how do you get the other 45, 50% to do this? I think that, that if someone cracks that nut, I think that'll be very interesting. The rest of the stuff I think can be dealt with. Right? So let me ask you a question which may sound very philosophical, but I think, um, you know, we, at some point of time, I think the humanity needs to answer it at least in the next year or so. We're going digital very fast, whether it's education, fitness, uh, you know, watching movies, everything. I mean, you know, and practically we are like almost 16 hours in front of a screen, give or take, uh, particularly in the times that we are currently. But do you feel that it will take at least a generation or two before we learn, and I mean, learn to imbibe, um, you know, remote, remote and probably digital culture of learning, performing, productivity, um, uh, you know, being able to give our best through the digital way and being responsible enough, you know, we used to the office culture where people were right in front of us and we could tell them that, okay, no, look, buddy, you're not going right there. Let's, let's try to work it out like that. Now, we're, I mean, I, I don't know what this person is, uh, you know, if it is one of my people, sometimes I don't know what they're thinking. They, they don't have my office door to say, no, open the two, you know, I, I have this problem, just help me out here. So, do you think it's going to take that? And I mean, for even for, let's say, even in ed tech, for teachers, teachers were not ready to teach students online. Students were not ready to learn online. So, I mean, you know, by the time real outcomes will come out of all of this, right now we are still in the infrastructural mode of it. You know, infrastructure is getting created, but at some point of time, there is going to be, uh, you know, result orientation that we will all have. So how do you think we can sort of, uh, speed it up? How can, how do you think we can ensure that we are able to get results out of it sooner? So, so uh, my own thinking is that, uh, see, we, we are now at a point where the pendulum has swung to the extreme end, the other end, where we are sort of prisoners in our own, within our own four walls, those who can afford to be, right? Those, right? Many, uh, so schools and colleges and, you know, so many universities in the US, even in India, are doing complete online session for the next semester. I think that, you know, we are inherently social creatures. We like physicality, we like touch, we like to meet people, you know, we like to go out and, and, and walk in the park or, or eat in restaurants or go to... So I think there will be a vaccine. Uh, uh, you know, there, there will clearly... Uh, I mean, in fact, I was watching a... a I saw a photograph of... Uh, some water body, I think it was a seashore or somewhere with chock a block with people. And, and it said, this was in Wuhan. They, were, they had a post-pandemic party 
and and because the fear of the uh, virus has largely gone in wuhan so this will happen over the next year and a half so the 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 world will come back to a point where uh, it's not going to be all digital for for ever and ever you know, right there will there, there we will figure out a lot of of uh, as individuals as families as corporations large and small and large medium and small companies as neighborhood businesses communities will figure out a way to incorporate digital more integrally into the way we do things right but it is not going to be all digital it feels that way now but a year and a half year two years on the road people will go out people we will be back to what we are doing and i hope so there will be a vaccine there will be immunity it will hopefully uh uh you know get to the point where it becomes like a a, a, a more virulent form of a cold virus what i do i do hope i don't know i mean we have not shown the ability to learn that lesson is uh to be more uh, respectful of nature and uh, uh less wasteful in our consumption and in our our uh, really this excuse me, destructive ways with the environment so uh, this this is yet, yet another this is one thing you know that a uh, small virus felled the entire uh, uh, world and brought it to its knees for a few months now man humans have a have a fairly deep uh, sense of arrogance uh, that god made all of this for us so whether that whether we learn this lesson in a, a for for the long haul or we'll go back to our usual ways 2 3 years from now i don't know i hope that we will and we are less destructive of the surroundings around us but uh, to your question everything is not going to be purely digital it will become more important clearly uh, uh, as i said many behaviors got accelerated people will innovate to make it more sustainable more productive uh, uh, and not just you're doing it because you have to do it there is no other way of doing it uh so it will become one of the another important channel of how we do things right uh but it's not going to become the only way i do, I, i don't think so i don't hold uh, such a pessimistic view of i think uh, we do we as you said we do like things in physical format and touch and feel yeah. uh you know as humans and uh, i think hope that continues and comes back soon uh, as yeah. we know i think after few months started missing it quite a bit yeah uh, but you know thank you so much surya for taking making time for us and talking to entrepreneur india here today uh, for all our my pleasure uh, who, my pleasure who were there today and asking questions thank you for uh, you know uh, keep it up in fact in fact you have more questions we are on facebook live with this talk keep on posting your questions we're going to ask surya or his team to answer some specific questions that you are likely to ask and uh, so we are hopefully next time when we meet it will not be over a screen but in person and when we can actually handshake and uh, really talk about and show things to each other that you know and i mean uh, you know given the fact that i think this person was a uh, gentleman was not able to ask his question but i mean really i mean how how is it if somebody has a product to show to you how is he going to show you over exactly oh, yeah 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 you're uh, exactly right Yeah. So uh, I mean, you know, things need to change, and eventually we need to come into a physical way of doing things. And hopefully, yeah. till then, we keep on bringing and educating you, all our viewers at Entrepreneur India, through this channel. And thank you, Surya, for making time today and joining. Thank you, thank you so much. My pleasure, indeed. Take care. Be safe. Take care. Thank you.